What is up, fight fans? We are back right here on MMA Weekly for UFC Fallout. Last night, another big fight card in Vegas. UFC Fight Night, Overeem versus Volkov, Sanhagen versus Edgar. What a night of fight it was, or fights it was, in the octagon. And we are happy to have you back here with us on this Sunday. UFC Fallout, powered by official CBD Emporium. That's their Instagram handle, CBD Emporium, featuring Level Select CBD. And you, my friend, can get 50% off right now by entering the code MMA50. That's right, MMA50 at stayinthefightmma.com. Stayinthefightmma.com. 50% off right now. CBD Emporium and Level Select CBD products because you know us here at MMA Weekly. Level Select CBD. Stay in the fight. I'm Jim Greasehopper. Call me Grease. Got my man Jeff Kane across the country in Kentucky. And it's realized, uh, Jeff, as I was talking to you before the show, man, Jeff's the king of the one-liners. I mean, if you're ever talked to Jeff Kane for more than 10 minutes, you get about 20 one-liners in that time. And, man, we I get to the point where I'm like, Jeff, save it for the show, man. Save it for the show. <laughs> but here we are back after a long night last night. It's good to be back with you, man. And we have a lot to talk about today in this hour show. Yeah, man. Uh, a lot of good fights last night. There was a lot of meaningful fights on that fight card. Uh, I don't think that there's going to be a, a lot of jumping in the rankings. I think there's going to be a lot of switching of spots, but there was a lot of meaningful bouts. One of the knockout of the year candidates for sure already, and I don't care what happens the rest of the year. Um, and, you know, so, some people's dreams were dashed and some people's, uh, you know, rose up that ladder a little bit closer to a title shot. Yeah, they did. And Alexander Volkov, Corey Sanhagen, chief amongst them. Both great performances last night, man. I'll tell you what, Sanhagen, and look, sometimes it's it's better to be lucky than good. Sometimes it's better to be good than lucky. And sometimes it's perfect when you're both. And that's what happened in the Sanhagen-Edgar fight. I mean, look, Frankie just went to shoot at the perfect angle like Masvidal and, and Askren. And sometimes it's just, hey, you close your eyes and swing and it's right there. And it hits perfectly. And not to say that it wasn't tremendous skill. It was, but everything has to line up for that to happen. And it was great for Sanhagen. But, Jeff, my biggest takeaway from that fight card last night, besides the fact that Benil Dariush is a great competitor in 155, and I think he actually has it in him to possibly make a title run. But the biggest takeaway from last night, where did this version of Alexander Volkov come from? I mean, we saw him knock out Verdun. We've seen him win some big fights. He was beating Derek Lewis and. I don't know how Derek Lewis survived that fight. Anybody else might have been finished. But at the end of the day, I have never seen Alexander Volkov so crisp, so clean, so concise, with power, with his striking. And he beat Overeem literally like a rented mule last night. And he did it with ones and twos. And for those of you who don't know the numbers, one, two is jab, right. Jab, right. Jab, right. For a righty. You know what I'm saying? So boom, 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 boom. Ones and twos won him that fight. Very rarely do you see a UFC fighter dominate another one on that level with a jab and a straight punch. That's what Volkov did. 100%. It's fundamentals. Just complete and utter fundamentals. Now, look, I, and I'm not uh, discrediting Volkov's win at all. O Overeem's not what he used to be. You know, his movement's not what he used to be. He's not as fast as he used to be. He was sort of a stationary target last night, and Volkov showed it. You know, he showed what, what you do to a stationary target. He established his jab, busted him up, and then the right hand started coming until Overeem couldn't take anymore. Um, Overeem looked bad last night. Uh, but like I said, that's not taking anything away from Volkov. He looked bad because Volkov was the better fighter and was touching him up. Uh, but I, I kind of – that might have been the last run for the ring, man. That might have been a last run for the ring. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, it's tough to see anytime that happens with one of your fighters. And you have nothing but respect for Alistair Overeem. And, you know, even in the chat, just getting us started today, Joe Ra, Joe H-R-A says, hey, Overeem is my favorite fighter since Pride slash K-1 days, but he needs to retire. And it's easy for us as talking heads, as fans, as people who love the sport. It's always easy for us to say that guy needs to stop. That guy needs to retire. That girl's done enough. You know, and there it is up on the screen right now. You guys seeing it. But it's easy for us to say. I mean, you think about Emmett Smith with the Cardinals. You think about, you know, O.J. Simpson with the Niners. You think about Joe Namath with the Rams. You think about any athlete throughout the years, Brett Favre with the Vikings and Jets. And, you know, it just it happens to where you very rarely go out on your own terms the way that you want. I'm not And Jordan didn't even do it when he beat the Jazz with that shot. You know, that would have been the greatest walk off ever. But even he couldn't stay away. It's very tough to do. Uriah Faber came back after he retired. Chris Lieben says he's finally retired 
after the knockout at, at bare knuckle. But it's so hard for these guys. And we say it all the time about the Sanchez's and the Condits and the Anderson Silva's. And we were saying it about Clay Guida until what he did last night against Michael Johnson. So easy for us to say, very, very tough for an athlete of Overeem's caliber to walk away. Yeah, I mean, Overeem's still a top 10 heavyweight in the world. You, you know, uh, I think what the what the fan and 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 what I'm kind of getting at is Overeem's not where he used to be. You know, we're, I'm a big fan of Alistair Overeem, man. When he come out there with that big hammer and would just knee the crap out of people. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Alistair Overeem. And... But we're not. We don't see that Alistar. That that Alistar Overeem doesn't exist anymore. And so, does Overeem continue to fight? Because he can. He's he's still going to be ranked uh, well in the top ten. Uh, but he's not going to get to a title fight. And so, what are you fighting for at this point? For a guy who's won the, uh, the Dream Championship, won the K1 Grand Prix, uh, you know, has won the Strike Force Championship, and been at the highest level of mixed martial arts since he pretty much has entered entered the sport. How do you, where do you go from there? Do, do you continue to fight for a payday and, and kind of to, to be a gatekeeper or, or, do, or do you walk away uh, now kind of on your own terms? You, you know, I, I agree with you. Nobody really walks away on their own terms, but Overeem has an opportunity to do that here. In my opinion, look, he tried to make another run at the age of 40 to a UFC title. He got really close, came yeah. up short, you know? And so I don't feel like this is the same as say, I don't know. I mean like BJ Penn, or, or somebody uh, uh, that suffered that, those kind of defeats. No, and you think back, Jeff, to September 10th, 2016 in Cleveland, Ohio, when he had Stipe rocked in Stipe's mm -hmm. backyard for the title, and he went for the submission, couldn't get it, didn't try to finish it on the ground. Easy for me to say, but when you look at that division right now, and you look at Stipe, and you look at Rosenstreich, and you look at Nganu, they have all, and now Volkov too, they have all violently finished Alistair Overeem, and those are the guys ahead of him in the rankings. They've all done it. And so when I look at that, I think to myself, you know, that's a tough road, and he's just not going to get there. Looking at the chat right now, Angelo says, should Volkov fight the winner of Rosenstreich versus Gone? We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, Blue Mazar says, wanted Overeem to win, but thought Volkov would take the W. Pretty, you know, much consensus. He was the favorite, too. And then uh, Blue Mazar says, To an end, and, and I think that it's great that guys like, for example, Frankie Edgar trying to make another title run. I think it's great when guys can try to make another title run, but it's also awesome when you see someone who is not as good as they used to be, like when a football or a basketball player becomes a role player. After years of being a star, they become a role player, and they can extend their career a la Vince Carter forever to do that in the NBA because he became a role player. Very tough to do, very hard on the ego. A lot of guys can't let it go. Carmelo had a tough time. He was out of the league. And you look at fighters, especially, this is a dangerous sport. The most dangerous sport, mixed martial arts. By far, there's no sport more dangerous than MMA, right? So think about this. You're 40 years old. Your reflexes aren't as fast. And never mind the power you hit with. Never mind your offense. I'm talking about your defense. I'm talking about the beatings that we've seen some of these older fighters take. They add up. And then when you get older in life and you got kids and then they have kids and you have grandkids and you can't go to their t-ball or baseball games and even realize what's happening around you. That's a real concern. So for fighters, the urgency to walk away while you still feel like you'll have your mental capacities for your entire life, that's a very real thing. And we don't even know long term what the effects will be because there hasn't been enough years to have that study. And we're just starting to see some of the pioneers hit their 60s and, and uh, mid 60s or into their 70s right now. Yeah, I mean, this is a brutal sport. I mean, there's other, as far as injuries go, there are definitely sports that they're, they're quote unquote more dangerous, but nothing's more brutal than combat sports. I mean, nothing. And, and uh, a fraction of a second of reaction time means everything. Uh, and, and, you, and you see that, like Anderson, that's, that's what happened to him. I mean, you know, I, I think that that's sort of what happened to, to Jones in boxing. There's certain people that, that rely on athleticism so much that, that when they lose that fraction of a second, that millisecond, it means everything. Um, Overeem, I, I, you know, I, I feel like Overeem uh, has accomplished everything. You know, he's accomplished everything that he's going to accomplish. Now, he, what he does have going for him is the heavyweight division. I mean, basically, Overeem needs to sit down this week and decide, do I have a three or four fight run left in me? If I do, I can get back to the title. If I don't, why even take one more fight? 
Drop to 205 and fight Glover. <laughs> there you go. I don't know. For the Reed, belt. 205. Yeah. If, if uh, Izzy wins that belt, no, he's not making 205 now in his career. But uh, we do have some questions there, Jeff, about who Volkov should fight next. Now, obviously, you have a vote in the rankings. So anybody who's getting this take from Jeff Kane right now, you're talking to a guy who votes on the fighter rankings for the UFC and Bellator. So, Jeff, I'm going to ask you in the chat room. We have people who are asked. BK is one of them. And uh, Angelo wants to know if it should be Rosenstreich versus Gone because you have number number two and number four fighting in a, in a couple of weeks, Blades and Lewis. You have number three and number seven, Rosenstreich and Gone fighting before the end of the month at heavyweight. And then you have Stipe and Ngannou, champ versus one. That's the end of March. So that's pretty well lined up. I can't see Volkov getting back in there before that shakes itself out. No, I, we're in a we're kind of in a wait mode in the heavyweight division. We need to see what's going to happen in the title fight because if something happens, there could be a trilogy fight there, you know. And so we yeah. got to wait. And yes. then John John Jones coming into the division, we have to wait. We, we kind of got to see. Volkov has aligned himself really well because what you just brought up, the matchmaking that's going to take place between now and the end of March. There, a lot of fighters or three fighters that are ranked in front of him are getting ready to lose. So he's going to, by default, pass them. And so when the heavyweight division, the dust clears and settles that out, Volkov's probably going to be number three just by default, <laughs> you know, well, because yeah. of this win. And yeah, so and, and, uh, and, 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 Yeah, I'm sorry. I've just, uh, my audio but we, kicked out. We lost each other there for a second. <laughs> no, go ahead, Jeff. We missed that. Go ahead. No, yeah, I was just saying that that he's sitting in a pretty good spot. And we're kind of in a wait and see. They've lined out this uh, these these events to where at come the come the beginning of the summer, we're going to know the heavyweight pitcher, and so we're kind of painting that pitcher right now. And it's all going to come to a pinnacle in the summertime when when the secondary matchups get to be made off of these that are taking place. But right now, we don't know who's going to win those fights. We don't know what's going to take place in the championship fight. And we don't know what John Jones is going to do. So Volkov's just kind of going to go home, rest up, stay sharp, and wait for the call and see see where the chips fall. Yeah, and Jones won't be in the rankings until his first heavyweight fight, obviously. So you have Nganu and Stipe. Whoever loses that fight, especially if it's a close fight, there might not be any slippage in the rankings for the loser of that fight. It might be just a spot or two, and we've seen that happen a number of times. For example, look at lightweight right now. Justin Gaethje coming off a loss. He dropped one spot below Poirier. That's it. You know, so Poirier did pass Gaethje, and you know you don't really drop much when you lose to the champ, and it's a good fighter. Even Gaethje got dominated by Khabib, and I think the the mentality there is there's Khabib and everybody else, which pretty much is the case since he's undefeated. <laughs> but I think Cyril gone against Volkov would be a really cool fight to watch. I don't know what it would do in terms of numbers. Rosenstroik's a beast. That's not an easy one for Gon, but I have a feeling about him in this division, Jeff, moving forward. I think Volkov's next fight, if Gon wins, that would be the fight that I would make. Volkov versus Cyril Gon. So, yes, Angelo, the winner of Rosenstroik and Gon, because Volkov has already fought Lewis. I think uh, Lewis Blades, I mean, that's a tough one for me to call. Blades is going to try to use his wrestling. Guys do this to Derek Lewis all the time. He usually finds a way up and finds a way to win and somehow musters the cardio to finish a guy late like he did Volkov. Remember that fight? So I don't know where this is all going to go. I have a feeling that it's in Ganu's time. I love Stipe. I have a feeling it's Francis's time and we're going to see Francis versus Jones because I think Jones is definitely going to get the winner. And again, this is something where, you know, Dana White and John Jones have a history and Dana will come out and say the guy thinks he's worth way more than he is. And Jones will say, I'm the GOAT. I'm moving up to heavyweight. Let's make this huge, right? So, and Jones would be right, and Dana would be right. And we'll see if they can come together. But the fight to make is Jones against the winner of Stipe and Ganu. And then you have Blades and Lewis, the winner of that, versus the winner of Gon Rosenstreich. But I would rather see Gon fight Volkov in that scenario. And, of course, we don't even know because all six of those fighters have to make it to fight night for all three of these fights yeah. to happen, which, as we've seen in the past, is definitely anything but a given. Yeah, and then they have to have good performances. Volkov logged his, you know, he logged his good performance. He's got it. Like, like let's just say that that the Blades fight's terrible. <laughs> you know, it's an absolutely terrible fight. Then they don't get anywhere closer to a title fight. You know, hell, Overeem might be closer than them if that fight's a dud. Uh, and so we kind of got to watch the way these fights play out. I think Overeem's only going to drop one spot because he has a win over the seventh ranked guy. <laughs> you know, yeah. and so he's only going to, and, and then gone and those guys when they get a win 
if they do in their next fight, they'll jump over Overeem. But right now, I feel like Overeem's just going to drop to number sixth in the division because he has a win over the seventh. And then every all those other guys that are right there below him are fighting soon, and they'll have the opportunity to pass Overeem with a win or stay yep. where they are if they don't. Yep, and Volkov has already lost to Derek Lewis, although he pretty much dominated that fight and just was unable to get the finish. Lewis finished him late with one of those bombs, but he has a loss to Blades, which, if you remember Dana after, Blades Volkov, I mean, you, you'd rather watch Ants at a picnic. I was going to say something else, so just, just fill in the blank of my phrase there, but you know what I'm saying. I'd rather watch Paint Dry, how about that, than watch Volkov mm -hmm. Blades too after what they did in the first one. So there, there's a big element to that. Lewis and Blades might be a snooze fest. Lewis has had mm -hmm. some fights where the the, the Ngannou fight, the the um, the Volkov Blades fight, the Blades and Lewis have both had very unimpressive performances before. So if that's not an exciting fight, you know Dane is not going to reward either one of those guys. So you can almost mm -hmm. say those guys are going to have to do something electric, whoever wins that fight, to even be considered, especially with John Jones coming in. You know, and then the mm -hmm. outside lurking in, you know, you never know. Izzy's already going up to 205 to take on Blachowicz. Maybe Adesanya. You know, if Jones wins the belt, they do that fight at heavyweight. And Izzy could try to become a three-division champ. There's so many possibilities that could happen. And I'll never say never to any of them with what's going on right now. But I will say this. Volkov is peaking at 32 years old. That's the best he's ever looked last night. Some of it, yes, you could say is the slippage and the decline of Alistair Overeem. And Overeem has taken punishment even when he beat Sakai and even when he beat Walt Harris. He took punishment in those fights. Reem always takes some punishment. He was unable to recover from the damage that Volkov did last night. And again, with the ones and twos, he literally split the guard at will with the jab. He was able to land that right so many times, Overeem a bloody mess. Volkov, very impressive, but he has had some fights that haven't been so good. So, I mean, anything could happen, Jeff. It's just, it's good to be able to have these conversations again about the heavyweight division, because for a long time, it got really thin there. And Stipe and DC carried it without those two guys. Who knows what it would have been. And then Francis has just been knocking everybody out on his way back to the top to get this title shot. Yeah, the heavyweight division is more interesting now than it's been in a, in a long time. Uh, and, and that's a good thing. But, you, you know, that these heavyweights, that, that's what I said, like Overeem's going to drop one spot. You know, all those guys in the top five, I mean, outside of Stipe, you know, and Francis, everybody's beating each other. You know, they, you know, and if they if they've lost to the, lost one, then they've beat somebody that that person has lost to. And so it's this weird kind of thing. The heavyweight division just takes one shot. You know, one shot changes the whole complexion of a fight. And so you're going to see these weird kind of up and down runs. I don't think any of those guys are far from a title fight. But John Jones, man, you know, John Jones is getting the title fight. And so everybody else is kind of on hold. Uh, and I hate to say that, but but it's the truth. Uh, and so we're kind of waiting to see what happens in the championship fight and see yep. if Jones is there. You know, how are they going to market that? Is Jones going to be there? Is Jones going to call out the winner? Uh, I think that people want to see Jones fight no matter who wins that fight. But I'm saying if Francis wins that fight, we might see a trilogy. Might see a trilogy because and, – and the UFC has a history of not really – doing right by Stipe. I mean, I can't forget when the whole Brock Lesnar thing happened with DC after Stipe lost his belt. He's the greatest heavyweight champ of all time, at least in terms of title defenses. And he doesn't even get interviewed in the octagon after he loses his belt. And there's been some disrespect there. There's been some issues between Stipe and the UFC. And I know this for a fact, but at the end of the day, if it's a close fight, do you give Stipe the trilogy or do you just go right to John Jones? And that, that could be something that, you know, it would be the right thing to do to give Stipe the trilogy for Stipe's sake. But in terms of moving the needle and fan interest and the big fight, it's Jones. BK wants to know, Jeff, do you think there's a dark horse? Because I'm coming at you like a dark horse in the heavyweight division. Kind of like the rise of Oliveira at lightweight. The dark horse in the heavyweight division. And, and I guess to me, the guy who I'm going to say is Cyril Gaon. Because not a lot of people exactly. know about him. And, uh, I mean, he's devastating if you watched his last fight. This is... He's going to get a big test, though, the biggest test of his career against um, Rosenstreich coming up. I, I agree with you. We, we all know the landscape of the heavyweight division. We know the players. Gon's the one, the wild card, that we don't know. And he's getting ready to get the opportunity to test himself against the top of that division. And so we're going to find out where he fits in. But I, I agree with you, Jim, 110%. He's the wild card in that division. We're not going to call John Jones a wild card. <laughs> you know, we're just not going to call him a wild card. Uh, he's right. John Jones. Uh, but he is a wild card in that division. You know, I'll say that. But as far yeah. as actual heavyweights that compete at, he at heavyweight, Gon is the one to look out for. 
without a doubt, Cyril gone. And, and if you don't know a lot about him, he beat Junior Dos Santos. He TKO'd him in December, and that's his biggest win in the UFC so far. Junior's kind of a placeholder now, and contenders have to beat him. He's become that guy to get to that point, and he might have fought his last fight over Reem and JDS in similar situations, except JDS obviously was a UFC champ. But Cyril Gaon is a world-class Muay Thai fighter and kickboxer. And that is why, Jeff, good God in heaven, I cannot wait to watch he and Rosenstreich fight because they're the two best strikers in the heavyweight division, at least as far as I'm concerned. When I look at kickboxing, Muay Thai, all around striking. Francis has the most devastating power in his right hand. Stipe might have the best overall boxing. You don't know. Volkov yeah. looks really good as a striker. But in terms of just kickboxing and Muay Thai, that matchup between Gan and Rosenstreich is as good as you're going to see in, in any division, let alone just heavyweight. Yeah. And, and what, what stood out to me is whenever you were just explaining all that is the diversity in the striking in the heavyweight division. You know, you, Stipe is probably the best boxer in the heavyweight division, but he's not a Muay Thai fighter. He's not a kickboxer. Uh, and so, yeah, man, those fights are going to be interesting. I mean, they're going to be, I mean, the heavyweight fights are always interesting, but I, I mean, I'm looking forward to the next couple of months, big time. There's, there's great matchups in the heavyweight division. And, and, but I agree with what you're saying about the striking on paper and as far as skill set and training, those, those guys are, are, are better strikers, but we can't sleep on how, how good Stipe is in his boxing, man. I mean, he kills people with his boxing. He does it, and his wrestling is good, which is how he beat Francis the first time and did take a big shot from Francis and was able to survive it. Just kind of like got to work, brought his Cleveland, Ohio lunch fireman pail and did, and got it done. But And that's what he did against D.C. in the third fight, which was amazing to see both of those guys go five rounds and such a highly technical fight. And you could tell they knew everything about the other guy by fighting each other three times, having three camps, for focusing on that one opponent. And the more times guys fight one another – the harder it is to do anything new or to take them by surprise, which is why I thought Stipe's underhooks walking DC to the cage and pinning him there every time DC went for a takedown. Still one of the most brilliant strategies and the execution was flawless. But when I think about that division this year moving forward, and we said this last night, I want to get your thoughts in the chat. What fights do you want to see? Who do you want to see fight for the belt? Where do you want to see John Jones fall into the heavyweight division? Give us your thoughts in the chat right now, guys. John Jones is walking into a division. Jeff, we talked about this last night. John Jones is walking into a division full of headhunters. I mean, look at the rankings at heavyweight and think about John Jones. Like, you'd be scared for Jones as a Jones fan or someone who loves him against any of these guys. Gone, Volkov, Lewis, Rosenstreich, Blades, probably a better matchup for John than, than a lot of them, and Ganu, Stipe. All those guys can take your head off with one shot, and he's walking into a division full of killers right now. I, I, I agree. And John's in John's favor, he doesn't take a lot of damage. You know, uh, no. he has been hit in his last few fights. He's had a couple of wars in his career, uh, but nothing crazy. You know, he, he typically Gustafson, doesn't take a lot of – Gustafson and then, um, oh, the other fight. Uh, it was Reyes recently. or Santos? Santos. There's one of them where he took some damage. I mean, he didn't take crazy damage. It's not what that wasn't like Gustafson damage, but he was getting Diago hit. hurt him pretty good. Yeah, I thought. Did and Diago so hurt him pretty good. Two thirty-eight. Yeah, see two thirty-eight, two thirty-nine. I, 239, I one felt of like he had Jones. Jo Jones has just been getting hit more, right? I mean, that's that's what, and that's probably yeah. because the competition has gotten gotten better and better and better and better and better. It's not it's probably Jones hasn't fallen off. It's just that the people, you know, Jones set the set the bar so high that to be a light heavyweight. You had to prepare for John Jones, you know, and I don't care how far out of the UFC you were. You start, you focus on John Jones. He's the top of the mountain. And so I think that that's what's happened is why people are landing on Jones now and they weren't in the past, but I don't feel like he's going to carry his attributes that he has over light heavyweights to the heavyweight division. And that's what worries me for John Jones. I don't feel like he's going to have the size and the reach and, and his fighting styles not going to work as well against Stipe as it did against other guys. Now, the, the common opponent is, is Cormier, right? We do know that John Jones did really well against Cormier, and that is a, 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 a legendary heavyweight. Um, and so I don't know, man. Jones is an anomaly. Jones is an anomaly. And plus, I think that people like to dislike Jones, and so we convince ourselves that he can lose, <laughs> you know? And so we talk ourselves in, in the, into Jones losing fights. Uh, but I, I, I still think that Stipe particularly is a – very bad matchup for John Jones. 
it's a, and he's a bad matchup for everybody, Stipe for sure, and that's why yeah. he's the GOAT, at least in terms of number of title defenses. But BK in the chat wants – he says, and Ganyu would smoke Jones, too much power, way too much. Okay, perhaps a bit of an exaggeration, but one mistake and Jones is KO'd for sure. One mistake and anybody's KO'd against Francis, literally. One mistake yeah. and, and you literally could end up eating through a straw for a year and a half against that dude. He's unbelievable. But – but for Jones, he's so technical and so smart and so good at setting things up. And his mental game is so underrated. His coaches are the best in the game, Jackson Wink. I think Jones has a good matchup against Ngannou because, and I hate to say this about Francis, but, you know, when you're, you're not a one-trick pony if you're at his level. And people say all he can do, he's got one thing, and that's his right hand. That's not true. He's gotten a lot better in every other area of his game. But that is the biggest thing you have to worry about. With Stipe, he's got power in both hands. His kicks and knees are underrated. He really can wrestle, and he's just so freaking big. He's like a tree. I mean, we saw that in the DC Trilogy fight. Stipe is so big and so strong. No matter how good of a wrestler you are, it's very tough to compete against him on the ground and to take him down. Jones hasn't had a lot of takedowns in recent fights either. He used to take guys down and maul them. His style has evolved and changed, but one thing's for sure – the shots that he was taking against Dominic Reyes and against Anthony Smith and against um, Tiago Santos, those shots in the heavyweight division are going to have that much more power behind them. I don't think any of those guys are a great matchup for Jones, but you'd have to say that, you know, the um, the Nganus, the Rosenstreichs, the Volkovs, the Ciro Gans, the guys who are really predominantly strikers are better matchups for John than the guys who can, you know, at least give him a stalemate in the ground game. Yeah, I mean, I think that Blades is probably the best match in the division for Jones. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I have to disagree with the commenter about Francis. I think that Jones is a smarter fighter than Ngannou. He's been in there too much. He's won too many titles, too many big fights, and, and not taken that much damage. He's going nowhere near Francis's right hand for at least the first two rounds. And so I feel like Jones is going to try to tie up, if, if the fight ever happened, would tie Ngannou up, make Francis chase him a little bit, wear him down, and then in the third and fourth rounds, have his way with a tired Francis and Ghana. That is not an option for Stipe. I, in fact, I break down that fight. Just striking, who's the better striker? I give it to Stipe. You know, in the clinch, who's better in the clinch? Man, I don't know. I kind of give it to Stipe. Who's the better wrestler? I don't know. I kind of edge towards Stipe. And so I, that, that's kind of oh, the way really? I look at that fight. Well, Over for that John? size... For, for that size, I mean, we look like I said, they have a common opponent with, with Cormier. It, it, you know, they both John and Stipe did fine with Cormier's Olympic level takedown. They, they both did fine with him. So, so maybe yep. he's at least comparable. He's at least comparable to John in the wrestling. But when I look at the other guys, John has clear advantages in certain areas, particularly the well, wrestling. The, <laughs> the wrestling, the wrestling. But here's the other thing about John, and, and it's easy to sit here and dissect if John Jones has a weakness, but his most glaring. And I don't want to call it a weakness because it's not a weakness. It's just the part of his game that you say, wow, this is something that hasn't really been there as much, has been the power. He hasn't finished people on the feet the way that you would think a guy like him would have been to be the GOAT like that, right? So he's been in there in some wars and hit guys for five rounds and not finished them, like whether it be Reyes, you know what I mean, whether it be Tiago Santos. DC, he got with the head kick in the second fight, but the first one was a decision. He hasn't had that classic raw finishing power that Stipe has, that Nganu has, that Rosenstreich has, that we saw from Volkov last night, although that was a lot of volume, 45 significant strikes in seven minutes. Jones has never had that power. How does that translate to heavyweight, where you're going to have to take these guys to deep waters, you're going to have to avoid those big shots for the first couple rounds and outpoint people because you're not powerful. Now, we don't know how much more power he's going to have when he moves up to heavyweight. There's a just as good a shot. John Jones goes up there and makes everyone look stupid. He's John Jones. I mean, let's not forget yeah. that. There's a chance he goes up there and demolishes everybody and has all this power that we've never seen before. He's stronger with his takedowns. How is that extra 20, 30 pounds going to gonna wear on John Jones? Is he going to get fatigued? Any questions unanswered? As you know, We won't even know those answers until we see him in there at heavyweight. Yeah, well, I think that Jones is going to be tested in, in ways that he's never been tested. You know, John Jones has faced adversity in fights, but he's never almost been finished. He's never uh, had to pick himself up off the mat and go back at it. 
Um, and I think that he's going to face that type of adversity in some of those heavyweight fights. Uh, if he, if he, if he doesn't just get slipped, you, you know, I mean, when Stipe hits you or Francis hits you, man, that how many of those can any human being take, <laughs> you, you know? Right. And so one or I, two. I, yeah, no, exactly. I'm interested in that. You know, it's crazy as it sounds. And look, I'm a big John Jones fan, man. I mean, he, yes, the guy gets in his, in his way, you know, he's his own worst enemy. Uh, but the guy's so great to watch compete. But the one thing I haven't seen out of John Jones in his entire career, and we've seen a lot, is him get put down and have to fight back from that. Gustafson, the only one. Did he get dropped by Gustafson? I don't think he got dropped, but he got hurt really bad. Remember one of those big ones was right before the end of the round? I don't think he got yeah. dropped in the Gustafson fight, but you're talking about someone actually dropping him. I'm talking about Frankie Edgar, Gray Maynard type of stuff. You know, can he come ah, back? Can okay. he, does he have that in him? Nobody's ever been able to push that out of John Jones. You know, it's not his fault that we haven't seen it. It's a testament to his ability that we haven't seen it. But I feel like we might see that in a heavyweight fight. We're, we might see John Jones have to dig uh, from places he's never been before. UFC Fallout right here on MMA Weekly, powered by CBD Emporium, featuring Level Select CBD. Stay in the fight, MMA.com. Stay in the fight, MMA.com is the URL. The code is MMA50. You get 50% off right now, guys. 50% off to feel like a champion every day. I just put the cream all over myself. They have three levels. Level Select does based on your pain level. I put level two on my back today, my lower back, my upper shoulders. Sitting in this chair, believe it or not, for all these hours every day gets to wear on you a little bit. Plus, on Friday, I kickboxed and I hiked a mountain at 49. Well, the Level Select CBD cream takes all that pain away and makes me feel like a million bucks. I put the tincture under my tongue every day, and I put the cream on as needed. It is absolutely unbelievable. It doesn't have all the shit in there like the those over-the-counter pain, quote-unquote, relief creams have. It's just the highest level, purest, highest concentration of CBD. No THC whatsoever, so you don't have to worry about that. And if you want some, you can always get your own and do it together. No big deal. But... CBD Emporium featuring Level Select. Proud sponsor of the show here. Stay in the fight. MMA.com. MMA50 for 50% off. I'm Jim Greasehopper. Call me Grease. That's Jeff Kane. We're talking about the heavyweight division after the win last night for Alexander Volkov. A great performance and victory over Alistair Overeem. A lot of people thinking Reem should retire or wondering who Volkov's going to fight next. The conversation evolved and Jeff and I, of course, started talking about John Jones' place in the division. And Jeff Hassan Aziz in the chat wants to know, where is John Jones in heavyweight rankings other than pound for pound? He's not. He's not in the rankings. And, um, you know, he, he's not going to be in the rankings like Michael Chandler until after his fight. So we'll see. But overall, where do we think he ranks? We don't have answers to the questions that we would need to know the answers to in order to accurately assess that. Is he going to be that much stronger? Is he going to have more power? Is his cardio going to slip? I would say based on John Jones, the way we saw him fight against Dominic Reyes, Tiago Santos, that John Jones would probably have some trouble in the heavyweight division. And I think John, if he's being honest, would tell you the same thing. But, Jeff, John Jones has a habit of rising to the challenge. John Jones is that rare athlete who can say, you know what, Dominic Reyes doesn't excite me. I, I could get off the couch and beat him. You know, and, and it's it's just there is some element to that. But a John Jones who's renewed, reinvigorated, and challenged at the prospect of fighting a guy like Stipe or Ngannou, becoming a two-division champion, and really cementing his status as the greatest of all time to ever put on a pair of UFC gloves, to me, you might see a reinvigorated, renewed rebirth of John Jones. So those questions would have to be answered. But as of right now, I'd have to put him right at the top. I'd have to put him right there with Stipe. Ngannou's got to prove to me that he can hang with Stipe. He got, cla he got just taken to school last time by Stipe. Easy for me to say, but Stipe's great. And Ganu got taken to school. He has a lot to prove for me to think that he would not be an underdog, at least for me, against John Jones. The only guy who I'd put above Jones right now for sure is Stipe. Yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're asking me where I would put John Jones if he were allowed to be ranked in the division tomorrow, I'd put him at number one. John Jones would be the number one contender in the heavyweight division, and I base that on his career at light heavyweight and 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 kind of that middle of the pack. There's only two guys that stand out in the heavyweight division, in my opinion, and they're fighting for the title. And then there's John Jones. And so I would put him as the number one contender, you know, uh, and because he's going to get that title fight anyway. And in my opinion, John Jones is the number one contender until he proves otherwise. I mean, my only question about Jones really 
uh, other than the, you know, the ones that you run through your head and try to, and you finally arrive at because you've run out of all other ways John Jones is going to lose. And so I'm like, well, what if he gets hit real big? Well, yeah, that could happen to anybody. But anybody. I want to see how Jones moves at 260 pounds. You know, he's bigger than he's ever been, and there is that point of diminishing returns. I'm too big. I'm actually slower than I was, or I don't have – the power isn't translating. So all those questions we cannot answer until Jones is in there. Uh, that's all. That's the only thing I want to know is how Jones how does Jones move at 250, 260 pounds? If he moves like he did he's as a light party. heavyweight, yeah. If if he moves as he did as he did as a light heavyweight, then Jones is going to have a lot of success over a lot of people in the heavyweight division. Still going to have problems with Stipe though. Yeah, and he's he's if you've seen the pictures of Jones at 240 pounds, <laughs> I mean he's jacked and ripped, and he doesn't look like he's losing any speed. He looks super strong. His legs, in particular. But it, it's crazy, and and BK says it. He says if Jones gets the heavyweight title, he's the undisputed GOAT easily, not Khabib, not GSP. Khabib's not the oh. GOAT, guys. Khabib is not the GOAT. Can we just stop right now with this Khabib GOAT shit? He is not the GOAT, okay? I yeah. love Khabib. Nothing against him. He beats Conor McGregor, who was boxing and running companies and, and injured before the fight, and he beats Justin Gaethje, who I love Justin, but – we're not talking about the all-time greats that GSP has beaten, that Anderson Silva has beaten. John Jones has demolished. John Jones has destroyed three eras of fighters. The legend killing tour, Lyoto, Shogun, Rampage, Rashad, all those dudes, Vitor, gone. John Jones wiped them all out. His contemporaries, Cormier, Gustafson, that group, gone, wiped out. The new generation coming at him. And John Jones told me in an interview before the Santos fight, we don't wait for them to get to the castle. We go out on the battlefield and get them before they get to the castle. He does that. Lionheart Smith, Tiago Santos, Dominic Reyes. He has beaten three generations of fighters and cleaned out that division three damn times. Khabib has not done that. John Jones is the GOAT. And Khabib is barely in the top five. Silva, GSP, Jose Aldo, pre McGregor. Think about what those guys were able to do. Think about what Amanda Nunes has been able to do before you just go calling Khabib the GOAT. We have a tendency, Jeff, in sports to do and to go with what's happening right now and roll mm -hmm. with that. And, and an undefeated fighter is an undefeated fighter. I'm not taking anything away from Khabib as much as I'm giving credit to all those other fighters. He is not the GOAT. There, I, I said it. I don't, I don't disagree with you on that, and I'm not trying to – hate on Khabib or anything. Look, I agree with what GSP says about the GOAT, right? There is no GOAT. You want to know the GOAT? The GOAT's 11 years old training in some gym right now. That's the GOAT. Go. And then whenever he gets to be 40 years old, the GOAT is going to be another 11-year-old kid training in the gym. The GOAT always changes. You know, John Jones is the GOAT right now. Before John Jones came around, it was Anderson Silva or, you know, G GSP. And, and when John Jones is gone, there's going to be somebody else for, that everybody's saying is the GOAT. Uh, that that's always going to change. Khabib's not the GOAT. Khabib's the most dominant lightweight champion in the history of mixed martial arts. I will give him that. Uh, I do not yeah. think that his resume comes anywhere near John Jones's or GSP's. Yeah. Recency bias. There you go, BK. And thanks for all that. We love you in the chat. Um, and I, and I want to get back to something else that BK asked us earlier. BK coming strong today. You'd be getting a prize if we had one yet. And you guys, by the way, in the chat, we're going to start giving away prizes. So make sure you smash that like button, right? Comment on our stuff. Subscribe to our channel. Keep it coming with MMA Weekly. We're going to be here for the weigh-ins, the post-fight press conferences, the live streams, the fight. Fallout every Sunday here at um, 3 Eastern, 12 Pacific, a whole bunch of new programming popping up all the time on our YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, MMAWeekly.com, the number one source for news and entertainment in MMA since 2002. The website's amazing with Ken and Jeff and Hunter and all them and Jake Hatton with the recaps. we got a squad here, and we're doing a lot, so make sure you follow us and stay with us. But BK's question, we're going to start giving you guys prizes in the chat soon. BK's question, do you think Prime Kane would still top the heavyweight division? in 2021 and my answer is simple prime kane would top now healthy prime kane would top the heavyweight division anytime he fought i have never seen a heavyweight who could handle prime healthy kane velasquez i think the second best heavyweight i've seen in my time was prime jds and that's not to take anything away from stipe but stipe's run was verdum and overeem and a raw, still raw in Ganyu, easy for me to say. And then two and one against DC, who fought at light heavyweight for all that time. So a lot of it, just like Khabib, Jeff, is timing. 
And when you make your run, you're not necessarily fighting the top guys. Like Khabib won the belt by beating Rage and Al. Give me a break. You know, nothing against Rage and Al, but he's a top 10 fighter, not a championship level dude. Yeah, you know, Kane is such a, you know, it was such a, such a disappointment, right? Because we saw how good Kane Velasquez was in, in oh. injury after injury after injury. And so I don't think we ever saw a prime Kane. I don't, I don't, I think the only people that saw a prime Kane Velasquez is the people at American Kickboxing Academy in the gym. Uh, I, I'm not sure that we ever got to see it because of the injuries Maybe and injuries. Maybe the Bigfoot, like Bigfoot yeah. 2. Yeah, you was, know, some of those yeah. performances that, like, or yeah. like uh, what he did to Bigfoot and Bigfoot 2. You know, and even against Verdum in Mexico City, you saw shades of it. He was hitting Verdum. I mean, that first round was all Kane, and he just gassed himself out. But the two fights against JDS, and when you the, the and when I say the two, I know they fought three times. First one he got clipped. The two absolute wars against JDS, neither guy was ever the same. It's almost no. impossible <laughs> to go through those wars and be who you were before them. That's another thing about this sport. Look, Woodley was never the same after the two Wonder Boy fights. I mean, you you go down the list one by one by one of fighters who just have never been the same after they've been through those wars. Frankie Edgar and Gray Maynard were never the same. You know, it, it, you could just keep going. Those wars take their toll. Robert Whitaker and Yoel Romero. I mean, think of those fights, right? Those kinds of knockdown, drag out, five round, just battlefield brawls. They take it away and they take it out of you. And eventually, you know, you got to pay the piper on those. And I think both of those guys would tell you, Cain Velasquez and Junior Dos Santos, while it was one of the greatest rivalries and greatest trilogies we've ever seen, it really put an end to both guys being at the top of that division. Yeah, I, I think that it, it uh, JDS was more affected than Kane, and, and we just didn't get to see because of all the injuries with Kane, you, you know. Um, but yeah, like Rory McDonald, I don't feel was ever the same after the Robbie Lawler fights. Um, oh no, not at all. And so, nope. yeah, Robbie man, I mean, this been is a the brutal sport. Since Condit and and Rory. Yeah, I mean, this is a brutal sport. You, you know, not, not only do you get the the uh, you know the head issues and, and whatever, uh, you know, the disappointment to get to the top of the sport and to fight and to put everything into it and to go to war. You know, to put your life on the line, quite literally, in those Kane and JDS fights. You know, and then to come up on the losing end of it. That is also causes a type of disappointment and a depression that people don't can't relate to unless you put 110% of something into something. And look, Jim, most people have it. And I'll be honest, man, there's very few things that I put like a hundred, you know, every bit of ounce of my being into. And when you fall, well, thank when God you the fall show's on, one of them. Yeah. You know, but whenever you <laughs> fall on your face, you know what I mean? When you fall on your face doing that, it, it's hard to get back up. It's hard to get back up, man. It's hard to put yourself back in that spot to be disappointed again. And that's a real thing, man. That's why fighters and athletes hire the psychologist and, and, and get uh, you know, hypnotized and go through all those things because, man, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult. It's hard to stay as focused as you need to be to do what Jones has done, right? <laughs> you know, to bring it back oh, to John Jones. Forget it's about just, it. Yeah, it's 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 crazy. You know, everybody has an off day, and that's what makes those people special. That's what makes GSP so special, and Jones and Khabib. It's what makes them so special is they didn't seem to have off days. To find a way to win when it's not your best night, like Jones did against Reyes, like Jones did against Gustafson, like Silva did many times, the Chill Sun and fight in Brazil, for example, got his ass kicked the whole night, found a way to get the submission late. There's that extra gear, that extra thing they have inside of them that allows them to find a way to win when most people would lose. And to me, that's what makes an all-time great champion, Stipe finding a way to beat DC twice. And that was a real tough fight, that third one. But it's really interesting, right? So when I think about this division, and we got to move on, we got about 15 minutes left in the show, want to turn the corner and start looking ahead to Usman versus Burns, Jeff. But, you know, it, it's Jones has always found a way to win. I don't believe you have to be a two-division champ to be the GOAT. That's something that, you know, some guys could do it, some guys couldn't. You know, and you have a lot of two-division champions now in the UFC. It used to be such a rarity. Now you have Adesanya is trying to become the latest, moving up to 205 to fight Jan here coming up. But at the end of the day, I believe if you're dominant in your division and you beat all comers and you clean it out, you're in the conversation. You clean it out twice, you're right there at the top. John Jones three times cleaned out his division to go on a run with as many consecutive title defenses as a GSP, as a Mighty Mouse. But Mighty Mouse, in my opinion, is disqualified because that division was so thin. They were throwing anybody in there 
to get a title shot against Mighty Mouse. And that's no disrespect. They rushed Cejudo, you know, to do that. And, and Benavidez multiple times. And Dodson, just not the level of competition that Silva, that GSP, I would throw Jose Aldo in there, his reign at featherweight and just dominating. I mean, whoever thought he was going to get beat, dominating everyone. And, you know, Khabib is in that conversation, but he's not at the level of a Jones. So we'll see. I mean, like the, the interesting thing to me, Jeff, is we have a lot to talk about in almost every division in the UFC. And as we turn the corner, it's power and featuring level select CBD. The code is MMA50 to get 50% off the website. Stay in the fight, MMA.com. Stay in the fight, MMA.com. Click on the video. It's me talking all about the effects that CBD has on me in my life. I use it every day. It's absolutely amazing. CBD Emporium featuring level select CBD. Stay in the fight. And we're going to stay in the fight here for about another 15 minutes, Jeff, on UFC Fallout. And I want to turn the corner and start talking about next week. Because I'm, I'm excited for next week. Number one, everybody knows I make no bones about it. One of my closest friends in the game is Kelvin Gastelum. I've known him since he was 16 years old. KG's had a rough ride since that Izzy fight. Speaking of five-round wars, taking it out of you, and you're never the same, I hope that's not the case for KG. But so far, his fight's against Darren Till and uh, Jack Hermanson. Anyone can get caught in a sub. But I haven't seen the same Kelvin Gastelum. He gets back in there against Ian Heinish, which is a really tough fight for anybody. How will Pedro Munoz rebound after the the loss to Frankie Edgar. Now he gets Jimmy Rivera, another fighter who's been on the downswing, who people thought might compete for a title a couple of years back. That's on this card. You got Macy Barber and Alexa Grasso as the co-main at flyweight. Macy Barber, one of the top prospects in the sport, looking to do some things coming off an injury herself. And then the fight that the whole world's talking about, man. The whole world's talking about Kamaru Usman and Gilbert Burns, former training partners. They have both been waiting a long time to get in there with one another. Colby Covington right there with him. That three-headed monster at the top of that division. And, Jeff, we get Usman and Burns in the octagon next week in Vegas, UFC 258. It's a great matchup. You know, titles on the line. They've got a, the backstory, you know, in the store, the drama, uh, which you always love to sell a fight, right? It's always good when you're a former training partner because then it gets leaked out on how you did against each other and then teammates get to weigh in and it ends up being the side story that builds all this momentum outside of the fight. Uh, I look I look forward to that fight, man. I don't know how it's going to go, though, Jim. I'll tell you that. Maybe as we get closer, I'll, I'll move closer towards a prediction, but I, I honestly just don't know how that fight's going to go. I can see it. You know, I, I like to try to play fights out in my mind. And when I do that, I, I see both guys have areas where they can have success in this fight, man. I just don't know how it's going to play out. Yeah, and, and Burns was a welterweight on his way up, moved down to lightweight, thought that would be the move in his career. You know, he lost to guys like Dan Hooker, for example, beat him. And that was at UFC 226. He put together a couple more wins after that. But then he moves to welterweight and just a completely different fighter in that weight class. Mm -hmm. Completely different fighter, Jeff. At welterweight, he's found a home. His biggest wins are Maya and Woodley, though. And that's whenever you think about that. And Woodley's losses were to Usman, to Colby, and to Burns. So, obviously, Woodley, people saying Woodley's just finished. To lose to those three guys, they might be the best three guys we've seen at the top of the division. But on the other hand, when you look at, you know, the Maya win and the Woodley win for Burns, Usman has been just laying waste to people. The Covington fight was a great fight. He... um Thoroughly outclassed Jorge Masvidal, who admittedly, you know, that wasn't a full camp for him. He came in late to replace Burns, but he's beaten Leon Edwards. You know, he's beaten Woodley. He's beaten Dos Anjos and Maya and Covington and Jorge. So he's beaten a lot more guys than Burns, but Burns has that world-class jiu-jitsu. So that, I don't want to say negates the wrestling of Usman, but he doesn't have the wrestling advantage in this fight, or at least the ground game advantage in this fight that he's used to having against everyone probably but Colby. But then you get to the striking, and both guys have really improved that aspect of their games. Henry Hooft working with Burns. To me, this one stays on the feet. I'm throwing a coin in the air. But on the ground, I don't know what to say either because Usman's wrestling is dominant, but then Burns' jiu-jitsu, man, this, this is just a great fight. Yeah, it, it is a great fight. On the feet, I mean, you know, it can, crazy things happen on the feet when the leather starts flying. Um, I, I, I think that that's an even, pretty even matchup, to be honest. On the ground, and what you're saying is very valid. You know, Usman can get takedowns probably in this fight, but he's not going to be able to inflict damage because posturing up, 
and creating space is going to be a nightmare when it comes to leaving himself open to be submitted. And so I feel like if Usman tries to work his wrestling into this, it's going to be kind of a lay and pray style because he can't take the risk on the grounds on the ground with Burns, who poses such a submission threat. Yeah, I'll tell you what I would love to see, and that's great analysis, Jeff Kane. I'll tell you what, we got two guys asking the same question in there. BK wants to know, if Usman beats Burns, what next? Another proper, in caps, rematch with Masvidal, parentheses, a fully prepped Masvidal. And then Hassan Aziz wants to know if he defeats Burns, Colby 2, or someone else. To me, it has to be Colby Covington. That fight was so close. The fake eye poke, you know, the whole thing that happened there. And then, you know, Colby really questioning Mark Goddard's stoppage in that fight which I thought was a really good stoppage, by the way. But Kamaru yeah. and Colby went to war for five rounds. That was one of the best fights we've seen. It ended the year last year, if you guys remember. Not 2020, 2019, December in Vegas. That's the fight I want to see next. Now, if Burns wins, it's also got to be Colby. No matter who wins this fight, it's got to be Colby. So if you're thinking ahead in terms of this division and Dana White's wet dreams as far as welterweight right now, here's how I think it would play out in terms of the UFC making money off all this. Because Usman and Burns are not big draws right now, and Colby can be. And Masvidal's got the second highest pay-per-view of all time. So obviously he's in there, or the highest of, of 2020 was Masvidal and Usman, not Conor McGregor and Cowboy. So that's Usman, but it's mainly Masvidal after the BMF with Diaz and The Rock and MSG and the whole thing. So long story short, when you look at that division, the wet dream for the UFC would be for Kamaru to win that fight. Then you get the Colby rematch. Colby beats Kamaru, and then you get the Colby-Masvidal blood war. That would be the one, the scenario that would make the UFC the most money, that would give fight fans the most sizzle. Kobe's put himself in a good spot, right? Right. He just broke it down. He, you know, he either gets the rematch with a champion or gets to fight the new champion, or he gets to rematch, or or he gets to do the big money fight that with all the drama that has less on the line, but probably more interest. Uh Kobe's yeah. not dumb when it comes to marketing. I'm not a huge fan of the way he markets himself, but it's smart marketing. I agree with what you're saying. I th- I want to see Kobe. Look, I want to see Covington and Mass at all for the same reasons that next weekend is because it has the same drama, right? Training partners, they don't like each other, you you know? And so I want to see that for the same reasons I want to see the the, the title fight. But Kobe's sitting in a good spot. I feel like... You never know what this dude's going to do. You never know. He might have Don Jr. in his corner for all we know. Like, you know, this guy, you never know, right? He got a call from the president on live TV. No other UFC fighter's ever done that. That was pretty impressive. What he's done for himself after being a quiet kid. but And Hassan wants to know, don't you think Colby and Masvidal would be great? Of course, Colby and Masvidal. It's a blood war. Bad, bad, yeah. bad matchup, in my opinion, for Street Jesus. Bad matchup. Really bad. But just as bad as Usman, by the way, for, for Masvidal. And I think that if I'm Colby, there's no way on God's green earth, no way in the blue hell that I would fight anyone but a title shot next after that fight against Usman, especially if Kamaro wins because he deserves that rematch. He was better against Kamaro than Jorge was, granted on short notice. But, you know, Colby versus Burns, sure, that's great. It does not have any sizzle whatsoever. Usman carries the hopes of this division on his back right now because it's very talent heavy. But in terms of, and even Colby, Colby's not that big bankable star yet. He hasn't shown that he is the only one in that division who is right now is Jorge Masvidal. Yeah, yeah, Kobe's the anti-star, right? He's playing the heel, which, trust me, Chel Sonnen did it. It works beautifully. Uh, it's smart. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to think of other people in that division. I mean, they're going to need another fight. You, you know, we still got Wonder Boy running around there who's, who's still relevant. He's still popular, but he needs yep. another win before we get him into those fights. Uh, or he yep. does, in my opinion. Uh, I think Kobe gets the 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 winner unless unless that the fight next weekend is just like a fight of the year candidate and like something like oh my god we have to see that again uh, that's the only way Kobe's not going to get the winner of that fight if you ask me and then even yeah, if that happens yep. Kobe's still going to get the winner yep and there's no stars you're right there are no the big time needle movers in that division minus. Jorge Masvidal right now. So Colby fights Masvidal, and Colby could be on the precipice. He could be right there, being that needle mover. The one guy who's a wild card here, Jeff, that I would throw out there is Kamzat Chimeyev at 15. And what we've seen him do, untested, unproven against the top-level fighters, but that's going to change when he finally, hopefully, fights Leon Edwards coming up here soon, who's 
number three, and we don't know about Edwards. I mean, let's say he violently finishes Chimeyev and maybe gets a Masvidal fight, you know, three-piece in a soda, um, part two. So I don't know. We'll have to see, man. It's it's pretty cool to think about the possibilities in this division. There's Colby right there being Colby. Good job by our production crew throwing yeah. that out there with his megaphone. And, yeah. I mean, he's got I the mean, weed. Look, you got to give it to Kobe. On. You know, yeah, lo- love or hate Kobe Covington, man. He makes things interesting. You he know, hires you, the strippers you, you, to be in his videos. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he makes things interesting. You know, and look, like I said, I don't know Kobe on a personal level. Kobe could be the greatest guy in the world and this all uh, be what he does, man, which would be even more amazing. <laughs> you know, if that's the case, then, man, maybe I really do like Kobe Covington. Uh, but, yeah, Kobe moves the needle, though. Kobe's crossed over. You know, uh, mainstream media picked up the, 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 US, the, the president of the United States called this UFC fighter, you, you know, and, and he got mainstream headlines. So he has crossover appeal. I just not calling any of them. We know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think that, that Kobe is the Bible. He's probably the most recognizable person in the division outside of Mads Vidal. And honestly, the third person, I would say, is probably Wonder Boy, even be over Usman. Yeah, Wonder Boy for sure. Wonder Boy has got that personality going for him. I don't know. I, I still think that uh, – Wonder Boy is going to be in that mix. I said it after his last fight. Wonder Boy is going to be in that mix somewhere this year. The guys in front of him are going to beat okay. each other. It's all going to play itself out. But Usman loses to Burns. Maybe he gets a rematch. Burns loses to Usman. Colby gets the rematch. Masvidal's in there. There are any number of ways. The, the top three guys in this division, Usman, Burns, and Covington, could tie up the belt and the title shots for two years Based on, you know, whatever happens in these next couple upcoming fights, there's a possibility that no one else gets a title shot. Because let's say Usman loses to Burns and it's a close one, then he deserves a rematch. Colby's in that picture. Whoever wins that fight, Colby would be in there. So those three guys alone could tie it up for a long time. But I am excited for this card, man. Any other fights on there that you're looking at and you say, man, I can't wait to see this one besides Burns and Kamaru? Well, you had to run down the fight card. I don't even have it pulled up right now. Uh, Macy um, Barber, Alexa Grasso, Kelvin yeah, Gaslam, I mean, that, yeah. Pedro Munoz, Jimmy uh, Rivera. Jimmy Rivera. <laughs> well, all of those. All of those. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's some meaningful bouts for sure. I, I want to see what, what Gaston look, looks like. I know that he's a friend of yours. Uh, that has no reason, uh, no bearing on why I want to see what, what he looks like. I'm just interested in Kelvin. You know, Kelvin's sort of a, a guy who's taking out some big names, man. And, and then yeah. I felt like I, – I, I, Whenever I said earlier, I feel like Kelvin's one of those guys that he's dealing with the disappointment right now. It's not a physical thing. Like, I feel with Rory McDonald was never the same because of physical things. You know, where other fighters, I feel like it's just mental, man. It's disappointment. It's hard to, hard to do it again. And I feel like Kelvin's fighting his, his way through that now. Now, I say that, I don't know Kelvin, man. But, but that's kind of the, from the outside looking in, I feel like Kelvin's fighting through, you know, maybe some uh, – uh, insecurity maybe self-confidence you know after losing some of those fights and now he's gonna have that's to rebuild himself point. man that's a fair point and jeff that that's you just brought up something that's huge in this sport man when you make that run and you're on fire and you're on your way and you're beating those names and you come so close to having that gold around your waist like you did against izzy and then you lose that fight at the very end one of the greatest fights we've ever seen and then you lose the next one it's so hard to pick yourself back up give jose aldo credit aldo's done it to get that title shot against Piotr Jan, and now he's got to do it again. But it's so hard to pick yourself back up after a crushing defeat and make another run. I mean, you see it every year in the NBA. The Jordan Bulls had to finally get by the bad boy Pistons, who had to finally get by the 80s Celtics. I mean, it happens in other sports all the time. But at the end of the day, man, when I think about this, and I think about this fight card, the the Kelvin Gaslam for sure is a big storyline, big one for Heinish as well. The uh, Munoz and Rivera fight, one of the guys is going to be in contention to be in that top five, nowhere near a title shot anytime soon with Jan and Sterling and Sanhagen and the return of Dillashaw and Cody Garbrandt sitting there. Neither one of these guys is going to get a title shot anytime soon. But there is one other fight on this card that I really am looking forward to for entertainment value only. How about Diego Lima and Bilal the Bully Muhammad? That, that's going to be a pretty entertaining fight on the undercard. Yeah, I mean, it could be fight of the night, right? The fight of the night could come from the undercard. That, that is a very entertaining that's a very entertaining matchup. And then, uh, as you brought up Macy, you, you know, you, 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 how big of a prospect she is. And I kind of want to see where, because there's certain fighters, you know, we watch people for different reasons. She's a fighter who gets so much better between fights because she's young in her career and that improvement's coming fast. And so you, she'd get kind of a new Macy every fight. 
and and that's why I like watching her and people that are at that mark in their career because it's so different. Like every time you see them fight, it's a different person. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. And then, the, and like I said, the main event, man. I mean, that that's the fight we're all talking. About. That, that's the one. <laughs> you know, all those fights could fall off the fight card as long as the main event happens. I'm going to be pretty happy. Yeah, no doubt. And and uh, just to say, Alexa Grasso, her losses are against former champ Carlo Esparza, against Tatiana Suarez, and against Felice Herrig, top level fighters in the weight class. And then Macy, even though she got hurt in the fight. Roxanne Modafferi was actually winning the fight before the injury and, and really looked like Macy wasn't quite ready to be in there against that level of competition, if that makes any sense. But uh, we'll see moving forward. I mean, we said the same thing about Mackenzie Dern a while back, and now she's looking like someone who might make a run. So next yeah. week is going to be exciting. UFC 258, Usman versus Burns. Guys, we're going to be here on Friday morning with the weigh-in show. We're going to try. It's hard. It's hard when um, our guys are inside the apex to get that signal right on the internet. So We'll figure that out or we'll do a pre-fight show that day. And then we'll have the live stream during the fights. We'll have the post-fight press conference exclusively here on MMA Weekly. And it's going to be a lot of fun. I mean, we have fallout coming next Sunday as well. Jeff, last thoughts for the week, man. Overeem, Volkov, the card moving forward, Usman Burns, whatever you want, man. It's all yours to wrap it up. San Hagen. That's San Hagen. That's what I took from that fight card last night. Oh, my God, did he make a statement. Did he make a statement? And we're going to remember that. You know, we're, we're going to we're going to see that replay. That's what stood out to me last night. And then next weekend, man, welterweight title fight on the line. What's not to like about that? Man, I'll tell you what. I will tell you what. Going to be a lot of fun with that 70 strap on the line next weekend. That's Jeff Kane. I'm Jim Greasehopper. This is UFC Fallout on MMA Weekly, powered by CBD Emporium, featuring Level Select CBD. You're going to get 50% off your order right now. You're going to get 50% off your order right now. You're going to get 50% off your order right now. All you have to do is go to stayinthefightmma.com. That's stayinthefightmma.com. Put in the code MMA50. Get past the ugly guy in the video at the top of the page. Be me. And just enter that code. You get 50% off stayinthefightmma.com. The code MMA50 for CBD Emporium featuring Level Select CBD. Stay in the fight for jeff kane for our entire mma weekly team want to thank all of you for being with us in the chat room you know we love you that's our heart right there keep it here keep subscribing keep liking keep commenting over and over again mma weekly the most trusted source in news and entertainment in mma for almost 20 years we're back at you next friday for the wayans with grease and kane make it a great day everybody enjoy the super bowl bucks in the under go tampa tom brady and the bucks talk to you guys soon